Um, now, I want to start our conversation. I want to open our conversation with um, one of the issues that we always talk, but then we forget later on. Uh, we talk when this happens uh, on the day, day off or maybe next day, and then after that, we, we forget. Uh, and I'm referring to the mass shooting uh, problem in the United States. And every time this comes up, everyone who owns a gun, they are so defensive. And I own a gun uh, personally. I have a concealed weapon uh, license as well. And I never feel like I need to give up my gun uh, when these things are happening. But there is this um, group uh, who believe that uh, gun control means that we have to give up our guns rather than looking into this in a different way and more maybe um, efficient way to fix the problem. So I want us to address that with your campaign, uh, what your plans are. But I also want to kind of uh, hear what you have to say with these mass shootings and how this could be prevented if it could be prevented. And uh, and also from the Delaware standpoint, is Delaware different than any other states? Uh, are we ahead of the game or uh, we still need to adopt more policies? So uh, it's, uh, it's on you now. So thank you for asking that question. Um, and and it's, it's certainly a question that I would say in terms of the, the tangible you know, discrete issues that I hear about from voters, the, 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 the reality of gun violence in our society is, is near the top of issues that comes up. And I, I know all of our hearts were broken with the news of the mass shooting in Maine that recently happened. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think any of us were surprised to see another mass shooting in the news. Um, it has become such a regular occurrence. But to your point, we can't let the fact that it's becoming a regular occurrence or that has become a regular occurrence stifle our outrage or undermine our sense of urgency in the need to adopt common sun sense gun violence measures. Measures that, to your point, majorities of Democrats, Republicans, and independents support. M measures that even the majority, to your point, of gun owners support. And that the opposition to these common sense reforms is from a small group of well-funded extremist activists at organizations like the NRA. Um, this is one of those issues where we know what the solutions are. We are the only country that sees the kind of gun violence that we see. And mm -hmm. that's not because Americans are more violent or homicidal than people in other countries. It's not because mental health is that much worse in this country than other countries. It is because we are the only country of our size that lacks the kind of gun safety measures that in some cases we used to have in this country and in and other in the terms of in the sense of or in the case of other countries that they have. That's legislation that, uh, you know, ensures that everyone who purchases a, purchases a gun has to go through a background check. It's legislation that bans assault weapons because weapons of war or slightly altered weapons of war to get technical um, don't belong on our streets. I, I'm, I'm proud that Delaware has done a lot on this issue. There is more work to do, but we have done a lot. Um, when I got elected... I got elected in a wave of, of what are called gun sense candidates, candidates who support common sense gun safety measures. And we had gotten elected after the Delaware General Assembly, unfortunately, had not done enough on this issue. Um, and after uh, getting sworn in, the Delaware State Senate passed a, a number of gun safety measures. Um, unfortunately, um, those those measures didn't get all the way through. Um, and it took the Uvalde shooting, the U Uvalde tragedy in that elementary school in Texas um, it took for leaders like myself and Attorney General Kathy Jennings and, and leaders in both the Senate and the House to speak up and say, we have not done enough in Delaware. And fortunately, through the leadership of folks like now Speaker Val Longhurst, um, Senate Majority Leader Brian Townsend, Senate President Pro Tem Dave Sicola, Tizzy Lockman, Laura Sturgeon, so many people coming together. Um, within a month of the Uvalde uh, uh, tragedy, 
Delaware passed the most significant gun safety package in our state history. It included an assault weapons ban. It included a ban on high capacity magazines. It included reforming liability shields that meant that gun dealers and gun manufacturers, even when they were negligent, mm -hmm. even when they sold a gun to a person who they clearly knew should not be purchasing a gun in that moment, finally holding them accountable and saying, the, the 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 rules of 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 our state apply when negligence is occurring in those environments and so we were able to move that forward and then just this past june i'm proud that i was the senate prime sponsor on bipartisan legislation that created gun free school zones in delaware because um up until that legislation was signed if an individual brought forward a uh, a weapon into our schools a gun into our schools they had not done anything wrong until they shot someone with it. And so our bipartisan bill, speak, former Speaker Schwarzkopf and I, changed that and made Delaware truly gun-free school zones. But this is one of the reasons why I'm running for Congress, because the reality is, as much as we can do at the state level, we can't fully protect Delawareans until there is national action. Because in a small state where weapons of war can come over state lines and into our communities very easily in literally a matter of minutes, um, we are not truly safe until Congress steps up, passes universal background checks, passes an assault weapons ban, and I'm going to be a voice in Congress that's saying now is the time. Last year was the time. The decade before was the time. We are long past time to pass these common sense measures that will save lives, and we know they will save lives. So uh, with this issue, Sarah, one of the uh, discussions that I had uh, last week um, uh, Sherry Doris Walker, um, she talked about the red flag uh, regulation and Maine did not have this, but Delaware has. And then she made the reference to the um, healthcare uh, and in um, uh, inpatient mental institutions, they work with uh, the law offices or uh, um, with the police department perhaps, but I didn't really understand. And then after that discussion, I went back to our uh, social workers. As you know, uh, you know United Medical uh, Accountable Care Organization, we have in our central office, we do have uh, nurses and uh, other individuals who are part of the uh, clinically integrated um, uh, care that we are providing. But then social workers are our key elements in terms of helping individuals who really need uh, special attention. And one of the reasons that we always need them to reach out to these uh, these patients, those who are going through depressions, those who are going through different struggles in their life with the social determinant of health uh, issues. So, and one thing that I ask them, whether or not, if we ever ask the patients if they own a gun. Mm. Now, I'm going to put this in a different perspective for you, and I'm going to hear what you what your opinion on this is. So. For example, if we identify in our case conferences, we, someone present the patient, uh, and once we know this patient has three, four different site medications, and maybe they are not getting the best uh, help that they need, would that individual be high risk uh, if they own a gun? Not just for the society, but for to for their own uh, self-inflicted um, uh, kind of harm that they can actually do. And I was thinking, why, why, why wouldn't we actually take advantage of that type of access that we have? Yes. So, you know, there, there's no question that red flag laws are part of the solution. I was part of the uh, movement that pushed forward and advocated for the red flag laws, the safe storage laws here in Delaware that we have. They are absolutely a part of the solution. There is no question that folks who um, we have reason to believe are a risk to themselves or others, that they should not have guns. Um, but we also have to be very careful, too, um, when we're talking about red flag laws to reinforce the fact that folks who are struggling with their mental health are far more likely to be victims of gun violence than they are to commit gun violence against someone else. That violence isn't um, uh, in and of itself a mental health issue. Yes, um, mental health crises can exacerbate risk, certainly to oneself, and in some cases, risk to others. And that's why, you know, red flag laws are an important part of the solution. Um, but we also don't want to create a situation either 
where we're creating a disincentive to get health care because of the risk that that a, a gun owner, for instance, would lose their gun. Because being someone who's struggling with their mental health does not in and of itself make you dangerous. And, mm-hmm. and it's a fine line. We want to make sure we're nuanced. We don't want to have any of the unintended consequences of reinforcing stigma or creating barriers to care. Um, but we do want to make sure that we have targeted policies in place like Delaware's red flag laws that really guarantee that if you are truly deemed to be a risk to yourself or others, um, that uh, we we take we ensure that you don't have access to the kind of firearms that can cause um, serious harm and injury to yourself and serious harm and injury and death to others as well. Um, but it's part of the solution. It's not the entirety of the solution. And I think, look, stepping back, there's no question that when we're talking about gun violence and we're trying to make clear that we can't solve a, a, a mental health crisis and expect gun violence to disappear, um, that doesn't mean that there isn't a mental health crisis that we do need to address. There doesn't mean that there isn't areas of serious improvement that we need to make in in proving parity when it comes to reimbursement for mental health care, in expanding support for providers so we're able to get more health, mental health care providers into our state. There are a whole host of elements in making sure that we are providing the mental health care that people need, um, but it's it's not going to be a silver bullet to connect mental health with, um, with gun violence uh, more than we've already done, I think. Fair enough. Now, my other issue with this uh, mass shooting um, uh, was and is um, you know how quickly we forget these things and like media covers it for you know like uh, first twenty four hours uh, like after what happened in Maine uh, last week uh, just two days ago in uh, where our office is in Bear um, a couple of blocks from here there was a shooting uh, three people died uh, some of whom were teenagers young people and we still don't know what really happened. And also, when I when I talk to some of our people in the office, they didn't hear about it. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know if we get proper coverage for these types of issues either. Like so quickly, we forget um, what happened, and then we just move on, and then no one wants to actually get involved or understand what's happening, or maybe help um, uh, their own families or friends. In some cases, I um, I'm actually extremely disappointed the way the society is these days where we so quickly forget and move on. Um, what's your take on that? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it, it, I was just in um, Dover yesterday uh, walking into a church for, for a forum. And as I was walking in, um, I was told that there had just been gunshots down the street. Um, and, and I certainly know I'm praying with everyone that was there that, that, no one was harmed and no one was hurt. And I'm not sure um, what the outcome was. You know, I, I I was working in the Obama White House when the massacre in Newtown, Connecticut happened. Mm-hmm. And it was it was the first mass shooting in an elementary school. And it's horrific that I'm saying the first, that there has been others since. I, I remember walking through the hallways of 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 the white in the White House complex. And it was still in a way that it, it's never been, it had never been still before. It was quiet in a way it had never been quiet because everyone was glued to their televisions, watching the coverage and ultimately listening to President Obama speak and address the nation with tears in his eyes, tr- tears streaming down his face. And I think all of us thought that that moment was going to be different. Um, now, gun safety advocates would tell you rightfully that we have made important progress at the state level on gun safety in the years since. And and of course, President Biden recently passed uh, a bipartisan gun safety package through Congress the first time that that's happened since the 90s. Um, But it is an outrage that after 20 something elementary school students were gunned down in their schools, that this nation didn't respond with the kind of meaningful action that their lives deserved and that the lives that we've lost since deserved. as I said before, it, it is it is disturbing how frequent this has become and therefore too often how numb society has become to this tragedy. And I think it, it requires all of us to, to treat this issue the way the family members of those who've lost their lives to gun violence treat this issue because they don't forget. They don't move on. 
Mm-hmm. And I think all of us have to see their pain, feel their outrage, and join them in demanding action um, and make sure that we don't forget that this shouldn't be normal. It's and the only way to make it not normal is for Congress to act. Now, uh, Lisa, I know you also uh, mentioned the reproductive rights uh, and abortion is a big uh, topic. Now, personally, and I just uh, want to be honest, um, I have my position on the abortion is a little bit different um, now, but that's because maybe I'm not uh, as educated as others, or maybe I might have my own issues, but I know that this is a problem for many uh, people out there. And I know you are actually helping them uh, and be the voice of uh, their rights. And and you actually added the reproductive rights. Mm-hmm. So that was a little bit different than just the, uh, may, maybe mentioning the abortion. Uh, can you just tell us about that work that you are doing on that side? Yes. Thank you so much for asking me this question. Um, you know, I, and I think so many people have different views and different positions, but For the majority of my life, uh, over 50 years of my life, I had the right to do with my body what I wanted. I, I, you know, and, and the, to see the Dobbs decision overturned really is, um, foundational to uh, 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 our own bodily autonomy. And I think about the issue of abortion care, of reproductive freedom, of reproductive rights as something that is medical, conversations between doctors and patients, that's important. I think of it as something as private. And I think of it as something that is about your family, your faith, whatever it is, your decision. And to see the restriction of those rights, knowing that I have a daughter and a daughter-in-law, knowing that I have now a granddaughter, um, I don't want us to go backwards. I want us to go forward. And what we know is the people that are most impacted by that that uh, you know overturning of the Supreme Court are women who are young women who maybe live in rural areas, women without means who may be poor, um, and women of color are disproportionately impacted by that decision. And so for me, this is a part of uh, why I am stepping up and running, because I want to protect that, that choice, our fundamental freedoms. I always say on the floor of the House and other places where I've testified and talked about this, there's no room in our wombs for politicians. It's just that it's not it's not our business to tell other women what to do with their bodies. It's a doctor's decision. It's the family decision. It's that individual. And most recently, many people may have been following the case in Alabama, um, the court there that basically is is now making it. Um, creating fear, I would think, for families who want to use in vitro fertilization, IVF, not just the individual woman and their family, but also those doctors, those people who transport embryos, the fear that they could be, you know, charged with with, with manslaughter or murder or something like that. It's both professional to me and it's personal. My granddaughter, my one and only grandchild, was born through IVF. My children, my son, and my daughter-in-law, um, I, I remember asking them, should I talk about this? Is it okay to talk about this publicly? Now, they had, they had showed their whole journey on social media, the journey of finally getting pregnant through IVF, and then having a miscarriage on Christmas, Christmas day, two years ago, then trying again and having success. And then having my granddaughter born five days after my birthday, Lennox. This is personal to me as well as professional. And so I'm concerned that there are folks that say they support 
this. But even in the Senate, they had an opportunity to vote to protect IVF with Tammy Duckworth's bill, and they did not do it. My Republicans, uh, the colleagues over there did not do it. And so I want people to know that in me, you will have a champion for your own reproductive freedoms and rights for those of your family. And that um, this is about a fundamental right. And so um, I thank you for allowing me to even have the platform to talk about it because, you know, we've seen across the country, Democrats and Republicans feel this way. Even in Delaware, after the last election, someone came up to me and said, I'm a Republican but I voted for you because you're fighting for my rights. So, you know, that's the kind of thing, right? So uh, we should be able to talk about everything. And it, even if you have uh, different opinions, yes. uh, I kind of feel like these, uh, in the last couple of years, we feel a little bit fear of having a different opinion or the tolerating others. Um, yes. And one of the reasons that I like to kind of, I settle in this country is because of the freedom of speech. Yes. Um, well, this is 25 years ago versus today, Turkey is in a much better position uh, than where they were. But for me, uh, this was where I felt comfortable because I didn't have to justify why I think of this or that. Yes. And I'm kind of like fearful that maybe we are uh, kind of losing that as people are not tolerating uh, different opinions. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully uh, with the uh, election coming up and uh, maybe settling certain things at the election, uh, that's going to kind of set the tone for the future. That's uh, what I would like to hope. I'm so glad you brought that up. Again, it's the theme of my campaign is Bright Hope. And it's called Bright Hope because it's the name of the church my grandmother attended for 70 years in Philadelphia. And it to me, it's not just the name. It is a way of being, especially in dark times or when you feel dark. And I want to bring people hope that while it feels like that, there are glimmers of bright hope. We passed a bipartisan infrastructure bill, the biggest. We passed the PAC Act for our veterans, bipartisan. We passed, we, we're doing things, the Safer Communities Act, which I got a part of it, break the cycle of violence because of the things I heard from people in our state. So I want people to have bright hope. And I can tell you, sometimes you, I think it's important that we do listen to each other, seek to understand. We're not always going to agree, but let's try to respect each other and let's fight for this democracy. Let's fight for this country. And, uh, you have a very have a schedule today, and I want to respect to that very quickly. Border security—it's one of those where if it's, I feel like both parties they are not understanding each other. Can you, from first hand, can you tell us uh, what the issue is and where we are going with that? Are we not protecting our borders? Yeah. Well, first of all, I mean, we've made major in investments and I and I've seen them and I've voted for them um, both on border security. Um, but I but I think we got to take a step back and recognize we have a broken immigration system. You talked about the the visas um, and we've had in the past bipartisan support to get things done. President Biden pulled together folks in the Senate, came up with a bipartisan deal. And unfortunately, President Trump basically said, put the brakes on this. Um, and and what I hope is that we will see something done again in a bipartisan way that recognizes even in Delaware, we have dreamers at Delaware State University. You know, we have employers that have needs. And then we have individuals that are look to this country as a beacon of light and protection. And so we've got to balance those different issues, and also protect our borders from things like fentanyl. That's important as well. We've got an opportunity here. I'm hopeful that our Republican colleagues will come together with us to make a difference and do something. We've done other big things. This is a big thing, and we need to get it done. And one last thing, and I, uh, uh, we don't want you to be late. So you are the first- I'm uh, already late, but that's okay. <laughs> So first Democrat who actually uh, bring the ceasefire in uh, Israel and Palestine. 
it was a little bit late, but you did it. You are the first one. So just like you are the first one for many other things, why are we behind with that? It's like all the other people, all the other people in the Senate and in the House. Yeah. Like, well, first of all, Kamal, I, I think this conversation deserves its due. Like that one minute is not sufficient. But what I will say is that when I ran the very first time, and after Charles died, I just put a big piece of paper up across the wall in my living room to say, why me, why now? And I cut pictures out and I put poems on there and I jotted down themes and I came up with three Ps. One was purpose. People should be able to live their purpose. That's health care. That's um, making sure that they have a house. That's making sure they've got a great job. The second one was uh, peace, that we have peace in the world. That's why I was an international relations major, but also peace of mind and peace in our communities. That's why I fight for those things. And then the third P was the planet. Delaware, we see climate change more than any place else because we're the lowest mean elevation state in the country. And so for me, if there's not a planet, what are we talking about? Those three Ps have guided me in the House. They will guide me in the Senate as well as working on democracy. Because as you remember, I was one of the people trapped up in the gallery on January 6th. So for me, this moment is about peace. And, um, and that's why I called for that long-term, immediate, and, and simultaneous ceasefire, because we need to have peace in that region and peace in the world. Kyle Evans J is with us. I'm here. Uh, our Delaware State Senator Kyle Evans J, uh, known for her commitment for environmental uh, sustainability, criminal justice reform, and ensuring affordable health care for all. And Kyle has been a critical voice for positive change in the state uh, legislators as she continues to work to create better uh, future for Delaware. Uh, her focus is uh, on innovative solutions uh, to some of our most pressing issues. And she's running for lieutenant governor. And she was with us, uh, I believe, sometime earlier this year, or it was maybe end of last it's year. Last year, I, I think, yeah. I, you know, like after the COVID, the time things are gone with me, so I can't really uh, tell what's happening. But I think uh, it was last fall. Uh, thank you for being with us. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much. It's great to see you both. So uh, today we are trying something different. So uh, it was, uh, you know, as we are trying to do things a little bit better uh, and trying to do different things, uh, then Sean had an emergency. <laughs> so to today, like yesterday and today, I needed him the most because a lot of uh, uh, backhand uh, coordination uh, needed, like, because we never have three different guests. So and then boom, Sean is having an emergency. So, but he's okay. Uh, he said hi to you. I saw him today. Uh, so uh, we want to actually focus on your campaign. Primary is uh, on Tuesday. Yep. Uh, how was your campaign? Uh, did you get what you were expecting from the campaign in terms of your uh, own performance? And uh, what's, uh, what are we expecting for after the uh, primaries? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for asking. It is um, what is on everyone's mind this week um, as we head into four more days before Election Day. Um, we, I've been really pleased with the campaign. It's been over a year now uh, that we've been on the campaign trail. I've been up and down the state multiple times, as you can imagine, um, especially making sure that being a Newcastle County resident, that I was embedded as much as possible in Kent and Sussex counties to be able to be a best representative of uh, what they hope to see out of the next um, administration. Um, what I always say to people is I'm superstitious, and so I'm always running uh, like we're running from behind. But what I will say is that I have an incredible team. I have incredible volunteers and, and advocates. Um, and I do really think that the work that we've been putting out there, our communications with voters, we've been getting, getting great feedback. And that's what you want to see. You want to you want to hear from voters uh, that what you're working on and what you're uh, lifting up is exactly what they want to see. And so I've been pleased with early voting. I've uh, had a chance to vote myself already, and I'm looking forward to Election Day. So do you think we're going to have a good turnout like overall for the elections, for primaries? I do. I do. I think that... Um, 
there's a lot going on. There are so many primaries this year. Um, so kind of no matter where you are in the state, there's either something at the statewide level or something very local that it, I think will drive turnout. We see a lot of competitive house primaries where I think that we'll see a lot of people coming out to vote. Um, and especially in the city of Wilmington where there's primaries for city council as well, I am really um, enthusiastic about the potential turnout in Wilmington and how we um, can continue to get people engaged in this process. As you know, we've talked about before, a lot of my work in the Senate has been on voting rights and voting access. Um, and I'm really excited to share and have been talking on the campaign trail about how my automatic voter registration bill has led to a 26% increase in voter registration. And that's what we want to see. We want people to come to the polls ready to vote and that they have access on that day. And um, I think we can keep doing more. That's, that's great. Now, um... You are still practicing law, right? So you, that's your full-time job is still going to you. So, uh, but that's going to change, I guess, after you become the lieutenant governor. Well, so I have been taking a little bit of a leave from practicing law while I've been running statewide. Running statewide and serving in the fifth. Senate District are two full-time jobs, let alone my five and seven-year-old, um, who absolutely deserve all the time that I and my husband are able to give them. And so um, I have been, I do a little bit of pro bono work, but I have been taking a break. And I do think, you know, practicing law and serving the state, state statewide could uh, be a tough call. Um, but I really hope that no matter what role I'm in, I'm able to leverage all the knowledge I've gained and my experience in the legal field to make sure um, that we're moving forward, making the best decisions for the state. Well, uh, so, uh, you know, we have your uh, billboard on. Uh, yes, thank you. The street right here. So uh, I don't know if you were able to check the video that I made. Uh, we have um, Bethany, yourself and Sarah. And I think that turned out to be the best corner of the city now. So uh, Thank I see you. people are taking pictures. Uh, and I try to avoid it, so I don't want them to think that I'm because I'm in pictures. So I don't want them to think that I'm looking at my own pictures. So I have to kind of be careful. But I uh, know <laughs> so at least three or four different people taking pictures there. Uh, that's actually, uh, this is kind of like one of the, uh, what makes this election a little bit more important is we have great women leaders this time. I think it's like a full house almost. And I am extremely proud of that. Uh, I have two sisters. I mentioned this to you before. Uh, one of them was uh, with me in our Turkey office. Uh, and the other one is uh, she's in the higher up in the governments in Turkey. And uh, being uh, a woman and uh, working and trying to compete uh, in the condition that was set up by men is not yeah. the easiest thing. And you guys are doing a great job. And I think Delaware is doing a great job. Uh, when I see one of the real, what, what inspired me for those billboards when I have three women uh, running for cute positions. Now, we didn't have room for um, uh, Congresswoman Lisa Rochester, but because she was in primary, so I didn't think she needed a lot of support from me, although we did support her a lot. But uh, I think that's going to be really important. Now, you have done a lot for... Um, families uh, and uh, making sure that they have uh, uh, they have uh, child care and early education support. Um, now, I have a young uh, parent in this room, uh, John Donnelly. I think you guys met before me. Uh, yeah. So uh, John has a six and three year old. They just start school. Both parents are working. And then when I see uh, the support and the focus from the candidates, who are actually promising things on childcare and early education. I think those are important because my employees here, a lot of young families. So what are they expecting in terms of uh, your campaign, your plans for for the future once you have the attorney governor's seat uh, as of next terms? Yeah, thank you for focusing on this issue. Um, and John, I hope that you're surviving the first couple of weeks of school. We are getting there, especially with our kindergartner who just started school for the first time. There's We learned there's no rest time in kindergarten, so it's been quite a transition. Um, but I think my focus on child care came from my own experience, but also from the experience of families that I was meeting across Delaware and while I was campaigning even before when I was doing advocacy work. Um, what I want to highlight for those who um, see this as just a very large problem, right? And it, it, how many, there's so many aspects to it, um, is just the opportunity we have here. 
as lieutenant governor, there's an opportunity to look at systems and structures. And that's what child care needs. That's what education needs. That's what environmental work needs. That's what health care needs. Um, and I think we need to talk more about how all of these things are connected. And so when folks in the healthcare sector are trying to help patients on the back end, right, what we're looking at and which we should be looking at from the government side is how do we move upstream and try to do interventions like providing reliable, safe, trauma-free childcare to working parents who uh, need that resource in order to keep their families um, moving economically and to make sure their children have access to educational opportunities as well. One thing I'd love to highlight is $30 million that was reinvested by the state recently um, in, in a program to uh, eliminate co-pays for parents, which will make it easier for parents to um, get, a, get child care if they need help, as well as investments that were made in providing parity and equality across our counties. So previously, um, Kent and Sussex counties got about 60% on the dollar that a Newcastle County family would get. And so we've brought that into parity. And what we will see there, I hope, is a reduction in those child care deserts, more of an opportunity for parents statewide to achieve um, child care access. And we're just really getting started because really the dream is and, and the, the hope is, is that we can slowly move eligibility up, provide even partial help for middle class income, middle class households, because those with middle class incomes are still oftentimes paying more for childcare than they do for housing every month. And we need to be realistic about how important this is, not just to get kids educated, which it truly is, but also so that we can get Delawareans back to work. You've heard John Carney say it, I've heard John Carney say it, we have right now about 8,500 more jobs open than Delawareans looking for work. So it's a workforce issue, it's an education issue, it's a family issue. I think it's something that could dramatically transform the outcomes in our state. And uh, and I know you're gonna be a great uh, Lieutenant Governor, and I know there is that's not gonna be the last stop for you. I believe uh, we'll see you in uh, other positions in the future as well. Uh, being a part of your campaign and being able to support you um, and having a voice in um, uh, your campaign from our point, like just being able to talk uh, on behalf of United Medical uh, Economic Care, uh, our providers, physicians, uh, our employees, uh, it's extremely important for us. And, um, and I do want to thank you for the opportunity. And uh, well, I just asked Anthony, uh, so I guess we'll, we'll be probably at the same place. Hopefully, we'll have a good celebration on Tuesday night. But of course, the, uh, it's not going to be over there just yet. But that's the big part of it once we uh, go through the primaries. So, um, Kyle, thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you. And, uh, I'm sure we'll have a lot more to talk um, once uh, we go through the primaries. And we'll have you back, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, and you were with us last year, I believe it was September, and, and we did tell you that we, want, we wanted you to come back. So this is that time for com coming back. So primary is going to be also important for you. How did you do? How is the campaign doing uh, so far? And what are we expecting on Tuesday? Well, I think the campaign's going remarkably well. I mean, the best time to campaign is, quite frankly, when you're not campaigning, right? So for... The last eight years, I've been to every senior center in, in Delaware uh, there for a while during COVID. We, we couldn't go, but we went there specifically, not to campaign, but to help people sign up for Medicare, uh, help people who were unfortunately taken advantage of by uh, these Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, so we have been to every Lions Club, uh, you know, uh, senior centers, uh, you, you, you name it, whether it's uh, AARP. We've been to every place that we can think of to go to, to sort of educate the public about what we do. We see people think that the uh, Department of Insurance sells insurance. And quite frankly, uh, that's something that we couldn't possibly do. We we regulate the industry. So it's been great. You know, I have had uh, fortunate, I've been fortunate to been endorsed by our the, the Democratic uh, Party, uh, as well as um, a number of other Entities including the uh, labor unions, uh, the AFL-CIO, uh, as well as um, 
the Stonewall Democrats and uh, a number of others. So, you know, it's, it's great to be an incumbent at a time where there are no other incumbents. Everyone else, at least for the other statewide races, are, will be new. Uh, I have a unique uh, eight years of experience as a regulator, and there's really no training for that. Uh, it really has to be sort of on the job. So I have a unique perspective that other candidates don't have. So I've been pretty fortunate uh, and blessed to be in this position. And people often ask, I know you have, what's next, right? Uh, <laughs> the truth is, I, I love what I'm doing, you know, because I used to be a police officer, a police in the community. Now I police the insurance industry. And uh, it's very rewarding because we're helping people. Well, I, I do believe that you have a lot to offer for Delaware in the future. Um, I know you make your decisions with your time frame, and I, I always tell people that I try to push them a little bit, but uh, I know that, uh, I respect uh, your own time frame, but I know uh, time to time I always use these um, uh, video records as my uh, proof that, uh, you know, you are going to, we are going to see you in different positions in the, uh, in the future. Um, so this election um, time uh, term, it's a little bit different. It's very tense. And uh, I know primaries are going to be, it's all about winning, but then being from the same party, um, uh, not just for your opponent, but the others, uh, I'm, uh, I have to tell you this, like I'm a little bit disappointed uh, in terms of how some candidates didn't really handle the situation well. So when it comes to this election, it's all about Delaware and our focus has to be Delaware. And being a small uh, uh, state, our niche is there are certain things we do. Like, you know, uh, our Medicaid program, for example, is one of the best Medicaid programs in the country. Uh, and you can't really do that in bigger states. So our size brings some niche uh, for our uh, uh, for our state. And in terms of having uh, insurance options, and I know your department did a lot of things to make things uh, more affordable. And I know there's more to do. And uh, but some of these comes with the experience, and you've been doing this for a while now. And there's the work is still not done. Um, yeah. So. What would you like to tell us in terms of your uh, uh, new term, uh, your focus, what are those going to be? Well, first of all, I have to say that I, I do agree with you that uh, I, I am really disappointed in this election season. I mean, typically in Delaware, we've had our disagreements, but it hasn't been, you know, dirty laundry hasn't been aired on the news, on the commercials. I mean, I, almost every mailer I receive is a, is a negative one. And that's really not Delaware. And I know I've spoken to a number of people who were really unhappy, um, you know, and turned off by all the negativity. Right. And, and you know, and it really, it doesn't help, right? I mean, for elections should be about the future. It should be about what your plans are. But unfortunately, it, it, in today's society, it seems almost okay to disparage your opponent, especially when you're short on uh, answers or solutions for the future. And so it really is, is frustrating for me. You know, I, I would like to think that my campaign uh, has been very positive. You know, we've talked about what we've accomplished, of course, like you'd mentioned, uh, you know, bringing more insurers into Delaware so that people have uh, options, right? So when you have options, uh, the, the consumers always benefit. But then on the other side, when insurance companies are, are conducting prohibited practices, you know, we have and will continue to hold them accountable. I don't know if you, if you just saw in the paper just a few days ago or on the media, in the media, we had fined uh, Highmark $353,000 for not- No, that my neighbor right now. Yeah, but yeah for not reimbursing, that's okay. We're, we're, we're in good shape. But for not reimbursing the, the volunteer fire companies at a level they should have been and uh, for sending the checks to the patient instead of the volunteer companies, which is in our code, is our law. So we found multiple violations for that, and we held them accountable. The good news is that we are um, they're, they're taking corrective actions, right, so that it won't happen, and so that the volunteer fire companies won't suffer, uh, you know, additional um, you know shortcomings because of the funding streams that come to uh, to them. So that's what we've done a few things in the past. But in, in the future, what I'm really worried about is two things. 
uh, artificial intelligence and if how that can be used to unfairly discriminate against people. I mean, we argue that computers cannot be uh, biased, right? But that person uh, who's designing the software or the program, whether it's intentional or not, conscious or unconscious, can be biased. Uh, so we want to make sure that, you know, for underwriting and claims uh, processing, that artificial intelligence does not single out people based off of things like their race or age or education or employment or zip code. So uh, that is a huge undertaking that I'm part of at the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. But the other thing that I mentioned uh, that is concerning to me is climate change. So uh, what's happened across the country, which the historic fires in Texas a few weeks ago, uh, the 200 or so fires that are burning in uh, California. And then if you look back at uh, the, the hurricane that just hit a few, about a month ago in Texas, I mean, that single incident flooded out about 100,000 cars. So that's 100,000 total cars that are, you know, have to be scrapped. And so people don't understand or realize that what happens in other parts of our country and quite frankly, the globe with climate change has a profound impact on what we pay for insurance premiums here in Delaware. Not to mention the, the cost to repair your car or your home. Do you know how much a, a two by four costs today? It's probably around $8. Right. A sheet of plywood is between 80 and 100 dollars. So when when we look to repair our homes due to storm damage, uh, the cost is, is through the roof. Um, so those are some of the things that I'm looking forward to to addressing in the future. Also, while making sure that insurance companies fulfill their obligations. And, you know, this insurance companies and I, when people hear this, uh, when your office is finding them, I want to make sure that they understand that this is not a punitive uh, attack on insurance companies, they, uh, they are given uh, privileges being able to run an insurance uh, company and also having a third party administrator in the same city. Yeah. So this is requiring for them to follow uh, our uh, policies and the policy is the clean claim needs to be paid in 30 days. Uh, clean claim cannot be denied. Um, and there are several different examples that I can give you right now, which uh, when we met a couple of weeks ago, we talked about some of them. And today, what we see is a lot of irregular uh, uh, ways of not paying uh, mm -hmm. for uh, claims. It's a clean claim. We have authorization and then it's being uh, denied for authorization. What we know is you cannot just deny that. And your office actually is the one that's helping uh, physician offices to make sure that uh, these claims are not getting th those types of denial. So that's why these insurance companies are being uh, dinged and being fined and uh, and every little bit of it they deserve. So uh, maybe they, yeah. you know, Highmark is a good neighbor here, so I don't want to, <laughs> you know, uh, round the boat with them, but they need to do their job. They need to pay their um, uh, claims in a timely manner, not just for Highmark, but Aetna, Signal, whoever is in the market, they really need to do their job. And I think your office, I know my office works with your office directly with these uh, uh, claims. We do report things to your office. And I know many physician offices, for whatever reason, they don't do. But one of the things that I also want to highlight, when we do this, yes, we are helping the physicians, but we are also helping the consumer, the patient. Okay who is struggling with those denials, and then they would be billed for that uh, if we don't get the resolution. So we are not just helping the physician, but helping the consumer as well. So uh, your office is uh, doing a really good job with us, and we are extremely pleased with uh, your leadership in that office. Um, now I, appreciate, I appreciate you saying that, you know, because when you help physicians, whether it's, uh, you know, ACOs, or whether it's primary care docs, or whether it's physical therapists, you know, we're able to, to make sure that their claims are paid on time, right? Uh, we're looking at things like prior authorization. Uh, we are working with the General Assembly and the Medical Society to pass that bill. And what, what that'll do is not only help folks like yourself and, and family care docs and, you know, specialty docs, uh, but primarily it helps the consumer, right? So they're not, they don't have to deal with the uncertainty of a procedure that a physician not an insurance company says that they need. And so we have worked with um, with the medical society to, to get that bill done. We're going to look at things like clawbacks, 
you know, insurance companies can claw back money from, from you and from um, uh, pharmacists and, and others who, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the That's code is two years, right? It's two years. But in many cases, we found that um, they're, they're, they're clawing back beyond that two year period. And mm -hmm. when that happens, and we don't know unless we get a complaint from folks like yourself, uh, there's nothing much that we can do. Uh, but we've been able to um, work with our friends in the General Assembly. And that's why it's so important to have people in, in these types of elected positions who have uh, relationships to get bills passed, whether it's codifying the protections of the ACA or codifying uh, a, a women's uh, health issues or rights to choose. Uh, we've been able to do that with the help of our General Assembly. I don't write bills or I should rephrase that. We can't pass bills, but we write them. And most of the bills that we have passed, 56 of them last year, were pro-consumers uh, that were, we were able to hold the industry accountable for fulfilling their obligations and protecting consumers at the same time.